ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Inherited uh, Arrhythmia's webinar series. I would like to introduce you to your very first speaker and moderator for today's event. She is a genetic counselor with Ambry Genetics, Miss Layla Shamrazadi. Layla, you have the floor. Thank you, Gerald. Um, welcome, everyone, to the first of the three-part webinar series. Uh, my name is Layla, and I will be moderating um, today's webinar. And today, on behalf of Ambry Genetics and the SADS Foundation, I'm honored to introduce, to introduce a wonderful group of presenters to kick off this webinar series. The title of today's presentation is a, um, The Pregnancy Journey with Inherited Arrhythmia. And during this presentation, our speakers will provide an overview and demonstration of fetal and maternal care during pregnancies affected with long QT syndrome. Then we will illustrate the psychosocial experience of a pregnancy affected by long QT syndrome through detailed experiences from a patient. And we will also examine the perspective of a genetic counselor working with prenatal patients with inherited arrhythmias. At the end, as Gerald mentioned, we may have some time for Q&A, so feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A box on your screen. On your screen. I'm just going to take a minute to introduce our speakers, and then we'll get um, started with the presentation. I'm very excited to introduce our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Teresa Harper. Dr. Harper is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Harper is the maternal fetal medicine division chief at the University of Colorado. She attended medical school at the University of Texas, Houston, and completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2003. She has also completed a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine. In 2015, Dr. Harper received an award in, human, in humanism and medicine resident at CU in, CU, in addition to several teaching recognitions and awards. She has been a member of the American Congress of, Obstet of Obstetricians and Gynecologists since 2008, as well as the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine since 2003. We're very honored to have Dr. Teresa, here, Dr. Teresa Harper here today. Next, we will hear from Dr. Bettina Cuneo. Dr. Cuneo earned her doctorate of medicine from the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. She has many years of experience working as a, as a fetal cardiologist specializing in the diagnosis and treatment of fetal arrhythmias. Her work has been published in over 60 peer-reviewed manuscripts in addition to multiple invited papers, books, and abstracts. Dr. Cuneo is currently serving as Director of Perinatal Cardiology and Director of Fetal Echo Telemedicine at the Children's Hospital Colorado Heart Institute and the Colorado Institute for Maternal and Fetal Health. And she is also Professor of Pediatrics and Obstetrics at the University of Colorado Medical School. So thank you, Dr. Cuneo, for being here today as well. Our third speaker, uh, Ms. Julia Wynn, is a board-certified genetic counselor Julia received her master's in genetic counseling at the University of Texas Health Science Center. She practices as a senior genetic counselor and clinical research manager at New York Presbyterian in Columbia. In her role as clinical genetic counselor, she specializes in cardiogenetics, where she sees pediatric and adult patients. Additionally, she develops and manages multiple genetic research studies, including large natural history studies and psychosocial surveys. Ms. Wynn is also a member of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. And our final speaker is Ms. Robin Jenkins. She is a mother of two, a girl and a boy. Although she is not a medical expert in cardiology, Ms. Jenkins does have tremendous personal experience with long QT syndrome. Her husband has long QT syndrome type 1, and her son was found to have a family mutation for long QT syndrome. Her daughter was found to not carry the mutation. Ms. Jenkins was part of Dr. Cuneo's two prenatal studies, both the fetal heart rate study as well as the FMCG study. Ms. Jenkins is also a pediatric nurse. We're very lucky to have Ms. Jenkins discuss her experiences with long QT syndrome diagnosed during her pregnancy during the end of this webinar. So with that, we're very, very lucky to have all these speakers here today. Um, we have a wonderful um, presentation in store for you. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Harper.
Thank you and good morning. We're just making this available for me to look at a, to use a laser pointer. It's my pleasure to be able to um, begin this discussion today about long QT syndrome and pregnancy. As it was described, I'm a perinatologist, and one of the things that I most enjoy doing is taking care of moms with medical issues in pregnancy and ensuring that they have the safest uh, journey through their pregnancy. A brief overview of the long QT syndrome includes an incidence of between 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 2,500 as the best estimate at this time. While there are over 500 long QT syndrome mutations known in 13 different genes, 85 to 90 percent of these at this time are either long QT1 or long QT2. They are mostly inherited in autosomal dominant fashion, and that will be discussed certainly more extensively with um, our genetic counselor. The typical presentation of this, it's usually found either by a syncopal cardiac arrest or pericardiac event or death unexpected in a relatively young individual. Diagnosis can be suspected based on one of these events or family history. There is very limited research, which makes it a humbling disorder to take care of in pregnancy. All of the research is retrospective, and it's based on large registry. One brief slide looking at the mechanisms for long QT syndrome. This shows a heart cell, an individual heart shell, and it, cell, and it shows the ion channels that we can see here, which are allowing sodium, potassium, and calcium to enter and exit the cell. The flow of cells in and out are the electrically charged molecules, which leads to the electrical signal to the heart telling it when to contract. And depending on where that heart cell is, if it's in the atrial or the ventricular area, the ion channels that are most commonly affected by long QT syndrome are the sodium and the potassium channels. We spend a lot of time talking about long QT, but what does long QT really mean? What it means is that when we're looking at an EKG, there's an interval from the beginning of the um, PQRST interval until the T point. A normal value should be designed, defined as less than approximately 450 milliseconds and prolonged typically between 460 and 480, and that does vary a little bit with um, gender and other factors. What this, what this means is that the cells in the ventricles would be responding more slowly to electrical signals, which can lead to arrhythmias, specifically the very concerning and risk uh, for lethality of torsades de point. This is typically seen in over 500 milliseconds uh, QT interval. In my opinion, the best study and the most comprehensive study of prenatal um, evaluations and postnatal pregnancy-related risks of hereditary long QT syndrome was published in 2007 by Seth et al. This study consisted of 391 women with live births between 1980 and 2003 from the International Long QT Registry. I would like to point out that 1980 to 2003 is not only a very long interval of time for women to have been pregnant, but there also were significant advances in care of women with long QT syndrome during the time of the study. This was pointed out in the study, and I will point it out several times in my slides. One of the important things that this study did is it looked at the genotype data and it actually documented if women were defined to be in long QT 1, 2, or 3. The outcome times were defined as the nine-month interval of pregnancy and the nine-month interval thereafter pregnancy, and those two periods were compared and contrasted. The primary outcome events in this study were long QT-related deaths, aborted cardiac arrest, and thinkable episodes. This is probably the most profound of the slides uh, from this research study, and what this shows is if you look here over on the far left-hand side, over the x-axis what we see are the different time points during prior to a pregnancy, immediately prior to a pregnancy, during the nine months of a pregnancy, nine months postpartum, and post-postpartum, which is defined as any time greater than nine months prior to the next pregnancy. 
on the y-axis shows the annual cardiac event rate. And what you will see in large, bold, red uh, blocks is that during the period of time prior to pregnancy, so quote unquote normal life or prior to pregnancy in the postpartum period, we are looking at a rate of approximately 0 0.04 to 0 0.09 events per year. What you see profoundly in the postpartum period is that there was a significant increase in events to 0.23 events per year during the nine months after delivery. This number up here shows that 17% of the postpartum events were either an aborted cardiac arrest or a long QT-related death. The remainder of these would have been a sinkable event or a much uh, more a less severe episode. It is clear from this graph that the risk for aborted cardiac arrest or long QT death was increased significantly, statistically significantly, in the postpartum period. And thus, we are aware and grateful to this study for alerting us to the importance of a close evaluation of these moms in the postpartum period. The annualized cardiac event rate by genotype is described here from the same research study. Across the x-axis, it shows the long QT1, 2, 3, and the smaller portion or the reasonably large portion of non-genotyped in this study um, uh, long QT people. Again, what we see is the women in the with the checkerboard um, uh, designation on the tab shows that the long QT, the women with the long QT syndrome were the ones who comprised most of the risk for a cardiac event in the postpartum period. So this is another way of showing that not only is the postpartum period the period of highest susceptibility, but also that women with long QT2 are certainly, at least in this study, um, the ones we should be paying the most attention to in the postpartum period. This is another way of looking at women, whether or not they were utilizing beta blockers or not. As I described previously, this was over a 20-year period of time, and over the second half of that time, beta blockers were becoming more and more standard of care in utilization of that medication to reduce the risk for cardiac events. And what was found in this study, although it was not the primary outcome, was that there was a significant reduction in risk for cardiac events in women in the postpartum period specifically. Um, compared to women who were not on beta blockers. So this middle set of uh, columns shows this is women off of beta blockers and their risk for cardiac events compared to women that were on beta blockers, which was brings them back to a very similar to baseline rate during or post-postpartum. In summary from this study, they reported a nine-month after birth associated risk for cardiac event at a 4.1-fold increase when compared to the preconception time period, which again is modulated by beta blocker use. This is another study that really was complementary to uh, the study I described previously. The important and different piece that was found in this study is highlighted in points two and three. It did show that a women with a history of cardiac events prior to their first pregnancy was associated with a ninefold increased risk for subsequent cardiac events, and therefore women who are identified as having this disorder based on their symptomatology as opposed to family history without events should certainly be monitored more carefully. It also confirmed that beta blocker use significantly reduced the risk for cardiac events. I'm going to spend one or two slides talking about maternal cardiac physiology and why this might be something that would change in the postpartum period and precipitate a higher chance for an episode. In pregnancy, there is significantly increased blood volume, as many of us are aware, and the cardiac output at term increases by 30 to 50 percent, which is a significant heart stressor even on a healthy mom with no structural or um, rhythm-related concerns. Additionally, the heart rate increases normally by 10 to 20 beats a minute. Postpartum, as soon as the placenta is delivered, there is a rapid change in the hemodynamic alterations with a slow, complete resolution of cardiac output still being measured as slightly elevated as far out as 24 weeks postpartum. Similarly, we wonder what the, what the um, potential 
play both progesterone and estradiol may have, as there is, as you can see on this slide, a very distinct decrease in both progesterone and estradiol in the postpartum period. The hypothesis being that the lack of estrogen may increase adrenergic activity and cardiac myocyte excitability resulting in the postpartum period. This certainly can be modulated with breastfeeding as well, changing the hormonal milieu even more. Thus, the thought as to why there is an increased risk for cardiac events is multifunctional. Multi, multi Number one, there may be a, the increased maternal heart rate in pregnancy can be protective in a bradycardia associated prolonged QT. However, postpartum, that heart rate is going to make a fairly rapid uh, return to its baseline and the potential for an increased QT interval. Additionally, the rapid decrease in estrogen progesterone may modulate um, in a not protective way, the risk for uh, the mutant ion channels to be um, leading to a prolonged QT episode. And finally, for those of us who have had children, there is certainly a pronounced uh, difference in the amount of REM sleep we're getting with the new baby, which certainly we're going to discuss can also trigger a long QT event. I'm going to talk now about the preconception antepartum and postpartum periods of time, just briefly to describe how a multidisciplinary team, including a maternal fetal medicine specialist, an adult cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, and anesthesiologist could cooperate together to uh, promote the best outcome for a patient with long QT syndrome. Preconceptionally, I would have a discussion with the mom about whether or not she's currently on beta blockers. If she is, we would strongly encourage her to continue them. If she's not, we would discuss the pros and cons of her initiating that therapy prior to a pregnancy or certainly in the near term and postpartum period. We would discuss whether or not she has been considered for an ICD placement or has an ICD placement. We would discuss trigger avoidance, medications which are known to prolong the QT interval, and we would discuss the genetics of this. Just to reiterate, beta blocker therapy relatively unequivocally has been shown to reduce the risk for events in the postpartum period and would be strongly recommended to use during pregnancy. For folks who do not uh, take care of pregnant women every day, the concern would be what is the medication exposure um, to the fetus and what things should we be watching for. Beta blockers have a known risk for fetal growth disturbance, um, and there is some placental transfer of beta blockers to the um, fetus and, the, and then hypothetically to the neonate as well. What we know is that the typical medication used is, a, is metoprolol, which we use not infrequently in pregnancy, and there is a very rare risk for neonatal complications, which can be monitored throughout the pregnancy very safely. To summarize, beta blocker therapy unequivocally, moms who need a beta blocker should do so during a pregnancy. Considerations of who should be on a beta blocker is people with long QT1 or 2, particularly in pregnancy in the postpartum period, women with a QT over 470 with an unknown mutation, and there is controversy, although it would be very reasonable to discuss with a cardiologist whether or not prevention of um, a, an event during pregnancy and postpartum may be considered as well. With ICDs, additionally, pregnant women have been shown to be very reasonable candidates for ICD placement, and there have been not shown to be significant problems with moms or babies who had an ICD when indicated. There are several, again, retrospective small studies that show that this is a very safe modality for protection of the mom when indicated. This is this one small study that looked at the risks to the fetus and particularly blood flow to and from the placenta after defibrillation. And it additionally showed that there was not a significant change in uh, utero placental blood flow after defibrillation. Who should get an ICD? I would always defer again to my cardiac colleagues. However, all survivors of a prior arrest with this diagnosis, syncope that's been refractory to beta blockers or women with a prolonged QT over 500. Again, the triggers of cardiac events, specifically long QT2, who is our um, population most at risk, would be things that are stress, sleep deprivation, or um, loud noises and abrupt noises, all of which you see represented here as normal postpartum life. 
in the small box on the left, you can see that swimming and stress has particularly been associated with QT1, and QT2 has been associated with sleep as opposed to sleep deprivation. Medications to avoid, there are a long list of medications to avoid for, typically for women with long QT syndrome, and many of these are women that we, uh, these are medications that we would often use in pregnancy, and so I recommend in the preconception period reviewing all over-the-counter and prescription medications these women are on. During pregnancy, there is no indication for an elective C-section. However, there has been shown to be an increased risk for fetal bradycardia. Two studies have suggested that there is likely an increased cesarean rate, and that cesarean rate can be attributed most often to babies who ultimately were confirmed to have long QT syndrome. This will be discussed further by Dr. Cuneo in her portion. During the pregnancy and, and intrapartum period, clearly avoidance of triggers will be important. Telemetry during labor and the postpartum period to avoid QT prolonging medications, maintain normal electrolytes, and keep them on a beta blocker and ICD if it's already in place. Postpartum, the highest risk period, although there is no consensus, suggestions and expert opinions suggest that we should be doing serial EKGs every one to two weeks looking for prolongation of the QT for that nine-month interval of time that's been defined as the highest risk time for these moms. And interventions um, should be considered if there is a significant prolongation. Beta blockers should be minimized. I love the idea of minimizing stress and sleep deprivation in the postpartum period, but whatever we can do to try to make that happen is certainly optimal. The, probably one of the more subtle things would be to watch for and treat uh, quickly and assertively depression, either with therapy or the option of potential medications. There is data that suggests that uh, oral contraceptives are not contraindicated with no harm or protective effect, but certainly the postpartum period, which they have to go through after a pregnancy, would be a higher risk period, and so birth control is a reasonable option to decrease the risk for unintended pregnancy. With that, I would like to transition to Dr. Cunio. Hi, everyone. I'm so delighted that you all are joining us. I'd like to really thank the SADS Foundation and the Ambry uh, Foundation for inviting us to, to participate in this webinar. It's, it's a very meaningful and exciting thing for us to do, and uh, we hope that, that you will enjoy it. So I do have one disclosure, and that is that I'm a consultant for Philips Ultrasound. I teach their fetal echo course. So I, what we'll be talking about today is uh, background for the work on fetal long QT, ascertainment of fetal long QT, <clears throat> how we make the diagnosis, how we risk stratify the patients, what's available for treatment, and what I feel is important for the future of this field. So Dr. Harper gave a wonderful background on long QT, but just to reiterate that it is an inherited channelopathy and is the leading cause of sudden arrhythmic death in infants, children, young adults, and even fetuses. In fact, long QT syndrome is causative in 10% of ostensibly normal uh, fetal demises and infants of sudden victims of inf sudden infant death syndrome. Long QT syndrome claims three times as many victims as childhood leukemia. As many people in the audience probably know, primary prevention is extremely effective in preventing long QT associated life threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So, ideally, we could diagnose long QT before birth and initiate <clears throat> primary prevention during infancy. After birth, the diagnosis of long QT is really quite straightforward. But before birth, we have to rely on either a positive family history or the findings of a fetal long QT rhythm. For the family history, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward because we know being an autosomal dominant disease that 50% of the offspring are likely to have long QT. However, without a family diagnosis of long QT, the ascertainment of the long QT positive fetus relies on the recognition and diagnosis of those long QT rhythms, sinus bradycardia, second degree AV block, ventricular tachycardia, and any combination of the two. The most common manifestation of long QT is sinus bradycardia, which is a subtle rhythm disturbance which is often unappreciated to be abnormal. And even fetuses with those signature rhythms, which are easy to, to pick up by echocardiography, 
the rhythms of ventricular tachycardia and second degree AV block can be misdiagnosed and delivered prematurely because of concerns for fetal distress. 75% 75 to 90% of fetuses with long QT syndrome will present with a sinus bradycardia and a decreased heart rate variability as you can see in this graph of heart rate on the y on the x axis and uh, rate on the y axis. 10 to 25% will present with the signature rhythms of either second degree AV block or ventricular tachycardia seen on this uh, Doppler tracing and this M mode tracing. So why is prenatal ascertainment important? Why can't we just diagnose these babies after birth? Well, the majority of long QT babies are unsuspected, undiagnosed, or misdiagnosed, and this can lead to uh, mistreatment and lack of treatment, early delivery, and even fetal demise. This was a pretty remarkable finding to me. This was a nice study which showed in a large obstetrical population over many years that they were able to diagnose long QT syndrome prenatally in one in over 8,000 patients, but we know that the postnatal recognition of long QT is one in 2,000 patients. So we're obviously very poor on fetal ascertainment of long QT syndrome. Another reason that prenatal ascertainment is important is that we have this opportunity for primary prevention of the life-threatening arrhythmias. And the pre- and postnatal surveillance, the management of the pregnancy, is different if the fetus has long QT syndrome compared to if they don't. For example, if a fetus is known or strongly suspected to have long QT syndrome, we can optimize the in utero environment by normalizing the maternal calcium, magnesium, vitamin D levels, and withholding <clears throat> QT prolonging medications from the mother. We can surveil for long QT rhythms by doing fetal echocardiograms or more frequent monitoring of the mother. We also will be on the lookout for torsade, and rather than de deliver these babies urgently, we can actually treat torsade in utero and prolong the pregnancy. And lastly, we can deliver the babies at a cardiac center of excellence with experienced pediatric electrophysiologists who know how to take care of babies with long QT syndrome. So what are the methods of ascertainment? If you have a fetus you suspect of having long QT syndrome, what, are, what methodology can we use? Well, we, we've used prenatal genetic testing for a lot of abnormalities, for a lot of mutations. It's not quite as straightforward for long QT syndrome. A genetic test costs $700 to $1,300. Uh, doing a percutaneous umbilical blood sampling is $8,000 to $9,000 um, and, and is risky. An amniocentesis itself is two to $2,000 to $2,500, and there is the risk of demise and a wait period. The other important thing that people may not realize is while the genetic companies, the testing companies, will look for family mutations, it's my understanding, and the Embry people may have a comment about this, that, that de novo testing is not possible. So if you have a fetus without a family history, the parents don't have long QT syndrome, but the fetus has all the, the phenotypes of long QT, you will not be able to get a diagnosis in utero. However, there's another way that we can diagnose long QT syndrome, which is a non-invasive gold standard for long QT diagnosis, and that's fetal magnetocardiography. All of you know that we can't do an EKG on a fetus because of the, the conducting effects of the vernix and the amniotic fluid, but it is possible to record the magnetic fields in the fetal heart and to diagnose uh, long QT this way. FMCG allows us to actually look at a signal average tracing, so this is essentially an EKG showing the P wave, the QRS wave, and also allowing us to measure the duration of the corrected QT interval, which in this patient with long QT syndrome is 647 milliseconds. Now recall, this is not a live-born child. This is a 28-week fetus, um, and we can get tracings like this with this diagnostic quality. We also can look at a rhythm strip and look at the relationship between fetal heart rate and fetal movement, which in the fetus is very important, less so important after, after birth. 
So I was fortunate to work with Dr. Ron Wakai and Dr. Jeanette Strasberger in Madison, uh, where the FMCG that I'm familiar with is. And we looked at a whole cohort of patients at risk for or suspected of having long QT syndrome. We evaluated 39 fetuses from 19 to 38 weeks of gestation. 27 had a family history and 12 presented with long QT rhythms. What we found is that there was no significance between the fetal and neonatal heart rate durations, QTC durations, or anything else, so it was a very reliable test. And that we also found that a corrected QT interval of 490 milliseconds, which is greater than the 95th percentile, identified long QT syndrome with 89% sensitivity and specificity. These are the results of our patients, which, which uh, have been published. Um, in red are the patients that were referred with a family history, and in black are the patients who were referred without a family history. And you can see that the vast majority of patients with a family history presented with sinus bradycardia, and that was probably because many of them had long QT1. On the other hand, five fetuses who presented with torsad and second-degree block had different mutations, long QT2 mutations, and even an SCN5, even two SCN5A mutations, which are very uncommon in the adult population. In patients who had second-degree AV block, um, there was a, a whole variety of different, uh, different mutations. But it's noteworthy that the long QT1 fetuses tend to present with sinus bradycardia and really require very little intervention, while those with long QT2 and long QT3, specifically the R1623Q mutations, uh, often will have more malignant arrhythmias in utero. This is a remarkable slide showing um, the continuous monitoring of, of four fetuses who had torsade. The areas in gray are the areas of sinus rhythm. So here's time in seconds here. Um, this is uh, the areas in black are torsade, and then the areas in blue are second degree block. And you can see that there are that the periods of torsade last quite a long, long time. In this uh, case here, um, the minimum was three seconds, maximum was 459 seconds, and a mean of 86 seconds. So a much different response of the fetus to torsade. They tend to get heart failure rather than um, rather than have sudden death like live-born people do. Our, um, our results also allowed us to risk stratify fetuses with long QT, and what we found was that those who had torsade in utero, as opposed to those who just had sinus bradycardia, had much longer corrected QT intervals, 659.8 plus or minus 31, versus those who didn't have torsade, where the Q QTC was only 549 plus or minus 55 milliseconds. So after performing this study, what we, what we concluded was it was possible to do risk stratification. And that the first point is that fetal rhythm suggests postnatal phenotype and also the genotype. So fetuses with long QT1 are most likely to have sinus bradycardia and have sinus bradycardia after birth and, and have more malignant arrhythmias later in their lifetime that when you have sinus bradycardia, it equals postnatal bradycardia and the, and the uh, KCNQ1 or the long QT1 mutation. And we don't need to treat these babies, and they do well after birth. And in our series, all had received beta adrenergic blocking agents after birth. On the other hand, when you have as a fetus post a post prenatal torsade or second degree block plus torsade, you're likely to have it after birth, and it's much more common to have a KCNH2 mutation or an SCN5A mutation. And these babies benefit not only from in utero treatment to prolong gestation, but will need medical and sometimes device therapy after birth. Fetuses with second degree AB block tend to either have postnatal sinus bradycardia or second degree block, and those babies can be pretty well managed with a pacemaker if the rate is very slow and don't need in utero treatment. And lastly, that if a QTC interval in utero is greater than 620 milliseconds, torsade is going to be likely. The unfortunate thing is we'd all love to have one of these in our own backyard, but it's, the availability is limited even worldwide. 
In fact, there have only been 15 case reports between 1999 and this year describing uh, long QT diagnosed by magnetocardiography. And as you can see, there's only 10 centers really around the world. It's an expensive research tool, and it's not generally accepted in clinical practice. So is there another way that we can suspect long QT? We certainly can't diagnose, this with, diagnose it without measuring the QT interval um, or without having genetic testing, but are there other features that perhaps could be easily identifiable? And buried in, a, in the Journal of Reproductive Medicine from 1995 is really the first description of sinus bradycardia that is associated with long QT. And it was by Dr. Um, uh, Vigilani, who says this reported case, the first case of Romano Ward, which is another uh, description of long QT, confirms that moderate fetal bradycardia does not indicate fetal distress, but indicates that fetus should be studied for fetal cardiac conduction defects in the newborn period. And her patient was, uh, they didn't do genetic uh, testing back then, um, but her patient and uh, the mother and the maternal grandmother both had a prolonged QTC on EKG as their ECG, as did the baby. So there, since that time, there have been other reports of bradycardia, but no one has really defined what the what the bradycardic range should be. The obstetrical range of bradycardia is 110 beats per minute throughout pregnancy. We wondered if perhaps since the heart rates of fetuses decrease as gestation progresses, that maybe so should the definition of, a, of bradycardia. And so we looked at the heart rates in babies with confirmed long QT syndrome, and what we found was that the majority of them actually were not at 110 or below 110, but very much within the normal range, with a large proportion of them being less than the third percentile for gestational age. Annika Winbow then uh, did a wonderful follow-up study, which, which looked at this in even greater detail. Um, she is, cares for many uh, families who have the long QT1 mutation, and in fact, more, more than one mutation. And looking at the third trimester heart rates, she was able to differentiate between uh, mothers and fetus or fetuses who had no mutation, those who had a single KCNQ1 mutation, and those who had a double mutation. And you can see that the heart rate progressively goes down with the severity of the, uh, the genotype. So those with a single mutation had a heart rate of 131, and those with a double mutation had a heart rate of 111. And what's really remarkable is that I don't think there's an obstetrician in the audience, including Dr. Harper, who would ever think that a heart rate of 131 in the third trimester would be abnormal. So we have this information, but we're not really sure what to do with it. And I think her conclusion was, was, was really very elegant when she stated that the current obstetrical standard for fetal bradycardia may be not useful with regards for long QT, but what fetal heart rate should signal the need for what type of follow-up is not yet known. And I think that's a very honest assessment of, of where we are. So what we are trying to do, Dr. Winbow and myself and uh, other investigators are trying to identify, uh, use a fetal heart rate gestational age algorithm to identify long QT before birth. And it really is quite a simple project, but it does make some sense because never again is heart rate ascertained as frequently and meticulously as during fetal life, right? The mother goes in every four weeks and the doctor listens to the heart rate. It doesn't cost anything extra. We also know that the bradycardia of long QT tends to disappear in early childhood, and there are issues about neonatal screening for all babies to search for long QT. I just want to show this one example of a fetus that was referred to us. Again, the heart rates were less than the third percentile, which is seen by this line, for gestational age. And this was the result of look of assessing this baby and then cascade screening in her family. And we see that the fetus is the proband here, and identifying the fetus identified two of her siblings and the mother, who were all three previously unknown to have long QT syndrome, and perhaps explained the miscarriages uh, late, fairly late in gestation of two of her siblings. So we have a care plan for suspected long QT with a negative family history, and that is really to, to ascertain them and follow them very, very closely. Since many of you have our 
probably are in, have a family history of long QT syndrome, though I'll, I'll, what I'd like to show this, and that is that if we know that that mutation is there and it, it, you're able to have a fetal magnetocardiogram, that would be wonderful. We could uh, help diagnose the mutation. And then based on uh, the, the knowledge about the family mutation, that would change our management um, and guide our management. So for long QT1 and long QT3, um, we would follow fairly closely with monthly fetal heart rate checks and monthly fetal echocardiograms to surveil for any other type of arrhythmia. For long QT2, we'd be a little more assertive in our surveillance, but everyone at the end would get a postnatal ECG and genetic testing. So our future directions are really to continue to educate our colleagues. Um, there is a lot of misunderstanding about long QT syndrome and what we can do prenatally. And I think if we just continue to stay the course and, and, and work with our obstetrical colleagues and, our, and the pediatric electrophysiologists, that there will be more awareness <clears throat> of this issue. And I think we also need to work on unifying the response to the bradycardic fetus so everyone, when they see a bradycardic fetus, doesn't try to get the baby out right away, doesn't try to wait till after birth to make the diagnosis, but actually tries to think about long QT uh, fairly early. And I'd like to really acknowledge the people who have helped me and been beside me on my journey uh, to the care and management of the patient with inherited arrhythmias, the FMCG investigators, especially Dr. Ron Wakai and Dr. Jeanette Strasberger, my collaborators, Susan Etheridge in Utah, Woody Benson in uh, Milwaukee, and Al George at Northwestern, the referring physicians, and most of all to the Long QT families who have entrusted us to take care of, of uh, their families uh, during these very important times. Thank you. I will now turn the uh, talk over to Julie. So thank you very much to Dr. Harper and Dr. Cuneo for really laying the groundwork as far as long QT. And I think what I want to do, also thank you to Saz and Ambry for inviting me to speak today. Um, what I want to do is kind of get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty in terms of making decisions about testing pregnancies when there's a known mutation within the family and the psychosocial issues that um, come with those decisions. So um, I think my first couple of slides, I have no disclosures, um, the outlines of what I want to look at today. I think all of this has been covered very nicely today. We've really focused on long QT syndrome because that is one of the more common primary arrhythmias in which there is um, a well understood um, relationship in which we can see arrhythmias during a pregnancy, um, but we don't want to forget about our Brugada syndrome, CPVT, familial atrial fibrillation, Wolf-Parkinson-White, and then certainly there are other conditions that are not primary arrhythmias, but certainly have arrhythmias associated with them, including ARVC, X-linked, um, Fabre, and Emory-Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. And there are certainly other conditions that I haven't even included on this slide in which you can see um, either maternal arrhythmias or fetal arrhythmias, and I think you know, some of what we've learned today will apply to these and, and some of it doesn't. Um, so we've been over this several times now um, in terms of most forms of long QT syndrome are autosomal dominant. There is an autosomal recessive form that's caused by compound um, heterozygous or homozygous mutations in two different genes that cause an autosomal dominant form of long QT syndrome, and I'll touch on that today. One of the very important things that comes with all of this of whether or not you're working with a family where one of the parents has an arrhythmia or you've been referred a family in which the fetus has been noted to have an arrhythmia is really taking a very detailed family history. And this goes a little bit beyond kind of the typical family history that we learned, and it's really this family history that's cardiac focused. And so we want to understand unexplained fainting, other types of fainting, Seizures um, is also one that we looked for, and this is not because we expect seizures to be associated with these conditions, but rather there are certain fainting episodes, cardiac fainting episodes, that can be um, mistaken for a seizure episode. Um, there are, because of the other features of these long QT syndromes, including deafness, webbed fingers and toes, learning disabilities, we want to ask about that and family history of people who have needed pacing or an ICD. And most oftentimes, um, this is not related to a long QT syndrome, but there certainly are, this is, can be a, a marker for having a family history of long QT syndrome. 
Um, less specific, looking for palpitations, heart attacks in a young individual, heart failure, um, and vasovagal syncope, simply because this is not something that's associated with long QT syndrome, but people can give, be given the misnomer or the misdiagnosis of vasovagal syncope when they're truly having a cardiac-related syncope. And so these are all kind of very specific questions that I ask um, family members when we're trying to assess a family history for an arrhythmia condition. I also go more detail into when there's been a death in the family. So we ask about any sudden unexplained deaths, but we ask about deaths in sleep and rest and exercise. When someone's had a car accident, we ask about a little bit more detail about that accident if we're able to. So was it a two-car accident in which there, there was some type of collision, or was it someone drove their car off of the side of the road, and it's potential that that might have been an arrhythmia event that let, led them to, ha to drive their car off the road. Um, we ask about sudden infant death, drowning. Um, we talked about seizures and kind of people who found deceased. So this is just an example of kind of evaluating family history. So someone might come to you and they have had fainting episode and they have a prolonged QT interval. And we might then go further into their family history and find, in fact, many other people on the paternal side have had fainting episodes. Several other people have had EKGs that noted a prolonged QT interval. We see up there that there's a paternal great uncle who died of heart disease unspecified at 71, and that probably is less likely to be related. Um, and then we have a great grandfather um, who passed away from heart failure and fainting at 65. Um, so looking in more detail at this, I think what I, sh I want to also point out is it's not uncommon to see fainting on both sides of the family. So you can see there that I've we also have a paternal uncle who's who has a fainting episode, because fainting in of itself is actually a relatively common thing. And so this what I think makes taking a family history and understanding the family history of, of long QT syndrome or another arrhythmia syndrome within the family so complex, because there's some very nonspecific features of, of long QT syndrome. So as, some, as the previous speaker has alluded to, there are different options as far as genetic testing for an arrhythmia condition in someone who they themselves has a diagnosis. Um, and these are, there are several different panels, and my gene numbers might be slightly out of date here. We're always adding new genes onto this list, um, and we know of panels for long QT, short QT, ARVC, CPVT, Brugada, Wolf Parkinson White. There are some labs, I think, that do publish an, an AFib panel. Um, it's hit or miss kind of how productive those are. And then I think many of us are aware that you can do kind of the omnibus of panels now where you look either at all arrhythmia conditions or even expand that to all arrhythmia and cardiomyopathy conditions, or even go further and include congenital heart defects all in one panel. Um, so increasing your chances of finding and something, and also definitely increasing your chances of finding something that you don't know what to do with. So um, I think that's for another talk, but just kind of understanding the benefits and limitations of these larger and larger expansive panels. Um, and I'll put, I put whole um, exome or whole genome sequencing on here really um, as kind of a precursor to discussing those as it kind of some of the fetal arrhythmias that are not so clear. I also want to point out that, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years in the atmosphere of insurance coverage as well as private labs and making things accessible to families has really changed. So, well, you know, cost can still certainly be a, a – it's still certainly a factor that plays into all of this. Um, this is something that more and more is actually becoming available to, to everybody that I'm very thankful for. I think everybody that's spoken today has highlighted this particular feature, and I think, you know, coming into this that used to be kind of why, why genotype when you have the phenotype, and really phenotype in many cases still drives um, the treatment and interventions that are being described, and um, we heard that just even when thinking about looking at the phenotype of the pregnancy. Um, I think it, it is helpful because it does help to guide a little bit more. I think um, it can be difficult just on an EKG alone to identify what type of long QT syndrome that you're dealing with. Certainly with an EKG and um, understanding the symptoms and when they're having the symptoms, you can take a very educated guess. Um, but as we've heard throughout today, really understanding if you're working with long QT type 2 is especially important if you're working with a mother who's affected or potentially a fetus who's affected because of the risks that we know are associated in the postpartum period. 
So also, as we've heard from today, you know, thinking about arrhythmia in a pregnancy, either with a mother who's affected or potentially a fetus who's affected, or in some cases, both, um, it really is a very much a team event. And so um, we've heard from our um, fetal cardiologists, we've heard from our maternal fetal medicine, um, but there's also neonatologists, our genetic counselor and geneticist, and fetal and pediatric electrophysiologists and our nurses um, that are all kind of centralizing this care and working with the mother and the family to really understand what's best for them. I want to stop for a moment and just talk about in terms of when you're working with a family in which the familial variant is known. So this, what I mean by this is this is a family where either the mother or the father has a diagnosis of a primary arrhythmia or an arrhythmia condition, and the genetic mutation that causes their, their um, arrhythmia is known. Presently, right now, if you have that information, there are a variety of options that are available, and no one of these options is the right answer. This is very much that something that, you know, is decided by the family and the care team as they take into account the kind of the, the goals and uh, beliefs of the family. So this is something that can be done in most cases through PGT or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in combination of IVF. This is also something that can be done typically with CVS or amniocentesis. I don't think we use pubs as frequently for this. It can also be done on a blood spot card or a cord blood sample after the baby is born. Um, it can be done on a buccal swab. Generally, most labs that I've worked with have wanted us to wait six months after delivery in order to make sure that we're getting buccal, truly um, child buccal um, samples. And this is also something where I've worked with families where they've made the decision to delay testing if they've taken appropriate other kind of screening EKGs into account. And I think all of these are reasonable depending on the severity of the disease um, within the family and what's happening for the child. I think some of the things that are very important to consider in terms of, especially when you're working with um, a family that's interested in pursuing a PGD or prenatal testing, is um, how the, the particular variant is classified. So oftentimes we feel very comfortable when we're working with someone who has a clinical diagnosis, um, when we receive a um, a pathogenic variant or something that's called a likely pathogenic variant, of calling that based on the information that we have in the family, we may feel very comfortable calling that that is truly the disease-causing mutation. Um, what's difficult, though, is, is that that call might not be sufficient for a PGD lab or for a prenatal lab to feel confident in actually calling that out for predictive testing that may decide what embryos are implanted or whether or not a pregnancy is continued. Um, and so very careful understanding these, and they might require some additional testing to further confirm the pathogenicity of the variant I've had to do maternal and Paternity and maternity testing, I've had to test grandparents, collect EKGs on grandparents in order to try to get the classification um, to a pathogenic um, variant. Um, and this is just a reminder. Um, I think as genetic counselors, we are familiar with um, it sometimes feel like the ever-changing ACMG variant classification, but the reason why I show this slide is to show that this is not a cut and dry science. This certainly does have nuances to it, um, and these nuances are, are user-dependent in some cases. Um, so just keeping that in mind as you're working with a family who may be frustrated by the process of having a variant that they've always understood to be the cause of their disease, but difficulty in terms of getting prenatal or pre-implantation genetic testing for it. Um, and I think I covered this. So the other thing to, play in, to keep in mind, and I think this is also a very key one, is the family's experience with long QT. Their decision about testing a pregnancy or testing after a pregnancy can oftentimes be very much affected by what the disease has been like for their family. Um, so in this particular example, I've shown a case here where a mother is 38, she has a diagnosis of long QT syndrome and a history of syncope, and she has a mom and a maternal aunt who also have this diagnosis and a cousin. Um, in her experience, she might make the decision to pursue um, postnatal testing based on the fact that this is something that's been well managed within her family on medication. Nobody's had any significant adverse events because of this, and everybody's been managed with medication. So she might feel very confident and comfortable with the decision that, you know, if her child is affected, this is something that is manageable and treatable. 
You can take the same family, though, and add in there that she's experienced an aunt who's passed away suddenly from long QT syndrome. Her perception of this disease can now change greatly in terms of the malignancy that she sees it and the, the, the psychological experience that she's had and, and her um, anticipation of, tri of having a child affected with this disease. You know, it might be the exact same mutation that's it's expressing itself slightly differently with families or something has happened where it just wasn't well managed in her. But at the end of the day, she's had a very different experience with this disease than the prior family. And so her making the decision might be very different than, than that family making the decision. And so this is, I think, as genetic counselors who are on the call and maternal fetal medicines and all healthcare providers, no one answers the right answer for everybody, but very, being very cognizant of that when you're working with families. The other things are cultural and religious beliefs um, and people understanding predictive testing for gen pre the implications of predictive genetic testing. So I think we all know this, but we know that as far as um, when you are testing a fetus and we are coming up with a predictive genetic test potentially for them, that they might not manifest symptoms up. So there certainly are people with long QT type 1 who do not manifest any symptoms, and now we have kind of this they're at risk for something that they don't yet have, and what are the implications of that. I'm going to just say two words, and I, I'm very cognizant of time, and I know we all want to hear from Robin, um, so I'm going to kind of speed through some stuff here. But um, I think one of the questions that comes up is when you're working with a family with a KCNQ1 mutation or a KCNE1 gene mutation, both of these are associated with autosomal dominant forms of long QT syndrome, but when seen in combination with a second mutation in either one of these genes, it causes jarville lane nelson syndrome, which is our autosomal recessive form of long QT syndrome associated with sensorineural hearing loss, and usually a much more severe manifestation of the disease that can be very difficult to manage. And so people always wonder, well, if I have a mother or a father that's known to have one of these mutations, do I need to think about the risk of my fetus being affected or my child being affected with this autosomal recessive form? And what I would say to that is, is that you really want to take a look at your family history in terms of the unaffected partner and really understanding the family history, sudden death, and arrhythmia. I think it's appropriate to get a screening EKG for that unaffected partner. And I think where you really need to think about this is when there's constant, when either there's some type, type of disease manifestation in the unaffected partner and or there's consanguinity of the couple. So you're worried about them being more common um, ancestry by descent and, and that other partner having a mutation that maybe they're not manifesting. In short, though, I think for families where you're not seeing these factors, the 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 risk is low. So thinking about the population um, frequency of this, of this disease and understanding the likelihood that their partner is a carrier, um, there's a reassurance of low risk. Um, I don't think I have much time for this, but um, so I put in here fetal arrhythmias, and I meant to say this. This is fetal arrhythmias outside of the family history. So certainly they do happen, and I think um, both of our previous doctors have talked about, you know, I think the fact that they do happen, and we've certainly seen them, but this is not um, kind of the common thing that comes through my desk. I'm more often working with families in which they're the one of the parents has an arrhythmia condition and we're worried about the pregnancy. Um, but certainly there are cases of de novo SCN5A variants. So in my experience, when I've seen a fetal arrhythmia, these have more often been de novo mutations rather than inherited mutations. So I think certainly as we've seen today, you can see inherited arrhythmias manifesting in the fetus. Um, but I think where we've seen some very severe arrhythmias um, in the fetus that have needed things like a pacing immediately after birth or an ICD placement in the neonatal period have been de novo um, mutations. So just going into this circle of care, um, I'm going to skip these two slides. I'd hope they've been taken out um, and talk a little bit about the postpartum. Um, and we talked about the importance of the of um, long QT type 2 in the postpartum period, and I think the other two doctors covered this really well, so we'll go through that quickly. I think it's helpful to just put all of this together that I've talked about into one family. Um, I'm going to pause here, though, in case someone want, in case Ambry would like me to skip this case presentation so that Robin has time. Okay. Oh. I think we're okay. Okay. Um, so 
this was a woman that came to us. She was 32 years old, and she was eight weeks pregnant when she presented to us. She was actually referred by her maternal fetal medicine doctor after she had delivered this history of having um, significant history of fainting episodes. So her first episode happened at 13 years of age. She experienced a seizure-like episode. She was seen by a neurologist and had a month of seizure medications, and then they were discontinued for reasons that she didn't entirely remember. She was on her own. She wasn't with her parents when she was reporting this. Um, she then subsequently had a series of fainting episodes that were triggered by alarms or phones ringing, and she actually ultimately self-regulated these triggers. So she just avoided these atmospheres in which she might have, might have experienced um, something that might trigger a fainting episode. She was a very active child and young adult. She was running greater than 30 miles a week. She was swimming. She was climbing um, and had an incredible active lifestyle. Presently, at um, 32 and 8 weeks pregnant, she had actually... Um, not wasn't being quite as active, but in her early 20s, she reported this incredible amounts of, of um, sports activities with no um, episodes happening during those. So she also had an episode when she was 20 years old of um, fainting while getting out of bed. She was evaluated at that point for vasovagal and had a positive tilt table test. And so she was just given this diagnosis of vasovagal, um, and it appeared at that point the kind of discussion of her episodes of, of fainting while with audio, audio triggers had not been brought up. Um, and then at 25, she returned back to her cardiologist and actually had a syncopal episode well in the waiting room, and she then had an EKG that um, me measured a QTC interval of 500 milliseconds. She was admitted to the emergency room, and actually at that point an ICD was recommended, and she declined it. She went to a different cardiologist and had a second opinion, and there she was actually, this was the first time she received the diagnosis of, well, outside the emergency room, that she received the diagnosis of long QT syndrome, and she was started on a beta blocker. Um, shortly thereafter, she had a syncopal episode well on her beta blocker, and she kind of decided, oops, this isn't for me. It's not working for me. I was doing fine for 25 years without being on a medication, and so I'll, I'm not going to do that. Um, this is her family history. Um, so she's there. I've pointed her out and given her the colored her in in terms of her long QT. She has a brother who's 29, um, and her parents were both in their late 50s, early 60s, um, and we did not have a copy of an EKG on either one of them. In her family history on her paternal side, there were some deaths in their 70s. Um, someone fell off the stairs that they were climbing at 78, and someone else died of pulmonary edema. Um, so within all of this, there wasn't anything that was strongly alarming for long QT syndrome within her family. Um, we tried to dig down it a little bit deeper into that 76-year-old that fell off the stairs, but again, he was also 76. Um, so she actually then proceeded to see an electrophysiologist, um, and she again was noted to have the prolonged QT interval with diffused T waves. She had a normal um, cardiac anatomy, and a loop recorder was placed. Um, this was early on in the pregnancy, and she had now seen a geneticist, an electrophysiologist, and in maternal fetal medicine. Um, the electrophysiologist reiterated, you know, I'm the electrophysiologist. I also, as the gene like the genetic counselor and, OB and geneticist and the OBGYN, recommend that you start on a beta blocker. Um, so this was actually a conversation that was, you know, went around to several different providers. I talked to her on several occasions, her electrophysiologist did, as did her maternal fetal medicine. Um, and eventually, it, it did, it certainly, I think this plays into kind of this discussion of the experience that she has had thus far of being stable off of a medication and having the counseling discussion about how important medication is and how her risk factors have changed now that she's pregnant and, that, and soon she'll be postpartum. Um, and so she did start on propanolol, um, which is one of the medications that's safe for pregnancy and breastfeeding. She ultimately had an, um, a normal, uncomplicated pregnancy. She had a normal fetal heart rhythm throughout. Um, she went on to have genetic testing for herself during the pregnancy. We were suspicious for long QT syndrome two, type 2, and we were also um, questioned if this was a de novo occurrence or if it was reduced penetrance within her family based on what we knew of her family history. So she consented to the long QT panel. She actually did have this done during her pregnancy. Um, and these are her test results. So she was found to have a pathogenic uh, mutation or a pathogenic variant associated with long QT type 2 syndrome. This particular variant had been identified previously. 
Um, we did have the discussion about simultaneously testing our pregnancy in terms of doing an amniocentesis and having that available. Um, and I think, you know, she that was something that really wasn't something she was interested in. She didn't have another reason to pursue an amniocentesis. There were no other fetal anomalies. She was not advanced maternal age. Um, and I think for her, it was very much the right decision for, you know, she, you know, understood that her electrophysiologist wanted these genetic test results to help manage her. We felt that this was comfortable to have, and then we were all very comfortable with the plan, as was she, to postpone the testing of, of the baby until after the baby was born. So um, we also tried to do cascade family testing, so we tried to test parents. The parents lived internationally. We've certainly had great success with testing parents internationally. This was not something that they were so motivated to do, and neither was her. And so unfortunately, we never were able to answer the question of whether or not this particular variant was inherited or de novo. Um, and she ultimately decided to test her, her son on a cord blood sample. So we, go ahead, we did go ahead and do that. Um, her, she, like I said, she had a full-term pregnancy. Um, she was somewhat concerned about the possibility that pain or fatigue could be a trigger during her labor, um, and so she did ultimately um, decide to have an epidural. She was given a private room because of the noise trigger, so this was something that all the nurses were aware of, her delivery team was aware of, that, um, that ar the arrhythmias can be triggered by, by noise. Um, after the baby's born, the baby had a neonatal um, e ECG that showed a range of 500 to 528. I think many of us know that these neonatal ECGs can be difficult to interpret, but certainly in this particular range, um, the pediatric electrophysiologist was certainly suspicious of a long QT syndrome um, diagnosis, and the baby was discharged on propranolol. Um, and ultimately, the baby was tested, and the baby has the same mutation as mom. Um, they're both doing incredibly well, though. Mom remains on our propanolol. The baby remains on his propanolol, and neither one of them has had any adverse events um, that they've reported back to us, and this baby is now a year old. So um, I think, you know, I, I've been playing this wheel, but I just want to show that that's the wheel, but there's so many other things that come in, into role of this. I think, you know, there's the patient support groups that I think are incredibly valuable in terms of giving the patient experience for these families when sometimes, well, we try our best not to do things in medical speak or medical jargon or present it in, in one way. I think it's very valuable for families to speak with other families who have experienced this. Um, working with their family members, um, especially when you have a family history of long QT syndrome, it can be incredibly reassuring if you are a sibling and your sibling has already gone through this as well. Um, the administrative staff in terms of navigating the immense amounts of appointments and, and, and things that happen with these types of complex patients are also very key in all of this. So just expanding that circle to really understand how big it is. Um, and I would just want to thank uh, my very expansive circle here at Columbia in terms of working in the cardiogenetics program. Um, and then I just uh, really a shout out to Dr. Wendy Chung, who's the geneticist that I work with and my mentor. Um, Priyanka is another genetic counselor who works in um, cardiology. And then Teresa Lee is actually a pediatric cardiologist and geneticist. And obviously, um, I, my collaboration with the NSDC Cardio Special Interest Group, SADS, and AMBRI, and of course all the families that I am so honored and lucky to get to work with. And I'll hand it over to Robin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. Um, so as far as disclosures go, I am a pediatric nurse, and I have participated in the research studies that I will talk about, but I am not representing the hospital or the studies in any way. Um, today I'm just a mom who has gone through two pregnancies where the babies were at risk of inheriting an arrhythmia and sharing my story in hopes that it can help other parents in a similar situation. So a quick background. Um, my husband had some cardiac events during his childhood that led to a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. As an adult, he underwent genetic testing to determine the type of long QT and find the gene to which it's linked. Um, he continued with his medication, follow-ups, et cetera, and we didn't put a whole lot of thought into it after that until we were ready to have kids several years later. Oops. Sorry. Um, when we were pregnant with our first child, we wondered about the odds of our baby having long QT. I had assumed the only way to find out was to wait and see after delivery or possibly do some in utero testing. And knowing that I would not abort the pregnancy either way and didn't want to risk complications of invasive testing, I thought we would just find out after delivery. But I decided to speak to a cardiologist to find out what to do if our, if our baby inherited long QT. 
We found out there was a 50-50 chance of our baby having it, and we spoke in detail with fetal and pediatric cardiologists to find out what that meant both for the pregnancy and for our kid's life. The cardiologists were a wonderful resource. In fact, they were so helpful and available, I think my obstetrician felt more comfortable continuing care once my pregnancy became considered high risk. So how do you know if the baby has it? Well, it turns out there are non-invasive studies available now to determine the likelihood of or even diagnose whether a fetus has it, and we were referred for two research studies and chose to participate in both. Also, after delivery, genetic testing can confirm the diagnosis. So now we have been through the process for two pregnancies with opposite outcomes. My two-year-old daughter does not have the syndrome, and my three-month-old son does. The two studies we participated in were a fetal heart rate study and a fetal magnetocardiography study. You've already heard about the scientific details for both, so I'll just tell you about my experience, my experience in layman's terms or fetal long QT for dummies version because that's what I needed. You can also find out more info on available research studies through the SADS website. In the heart rate study, Dr. Cunio was tracking fetal heart rates for babies at risk of having long QT with the idea that um, she would be able to provide obstetricians with better guidelines for knowing when an intervention or preventative measure may be necessary and when to suspect long QT with or without a family history. This is especially important because some babies with urysmia have heart rates that are within norm what is considered to be the normal range. Participation in this study was pretty easy. We just had our OB use a Doppler to count the fetal heart rate for a full minute at each OB visit. We reported all of the fetal heart rates from OB visits and ultrasounds to Dr. Cuneo, and then also provided her with the results of the genetics test after the baby was born to confirm a diagnosis. The study is based in Colorado, but since the information can be collected and reported, you could participate from anywhere. One of the goals is to show evidence that arrhythmias may still be present despite the baby having a heart rate within the normal range, and this was the case for us with our second child. Although his heart rates were consistently in the low end of the range, they were considered to be within normal limits. Had we not known that our kids were at risk, long QT could have gone undiagnosed. The second study involved fetal magnetocardiography, or FMCG for short. It's run by Drs. Wakai, Strasberger, and Cuneo out of Madison, Wisconsin and it uses newer technology that can detect tiny magnetic signals to pick up fetal heart rate and rhythm since electrical signals like those used for an ECG cannot be detected in a fetus. Basically, this is done while lying for a while in a room that could double as the bat cave with a big machine pointed at your belly. Probably took about two hours. I suppose it gets boring and could cause claustrophobia, but I took advantage of the chance to take a nap while the machine and the researchers did all the work. Since the necessary equipment is in Madison, it required traveling, but it's funded by the NIH and travel was paid for. During both pregnancies, they flew my husband and me out to participate. They tried to do the testing around 27 weeks gestational age, and unfortunately for us, both our kids are spring babies, so that meant two trips to Wisconsin in the winter, which is just mean for someone who's too pregnant to go sledding. But we survived the cold just fine, and we were able to find out the results right away, and the team re made recommendations to my OB for pregnancy management. After the birth of each of our children, we sent blood samples to be tested for a definitive diagnosis. Since my husband had already done genetic testing, they knew exactly what to look for, which made it easier for the lab and less expensive for us, although the majority of it was covered by insurance. We opted to take blood from the umbilical cord after delivery so our newborns would not need to get poked with the needle, and this was a very welcome alternative, since coming out of the birth canal is enough trauma for a baby for one day. You can get a cord blood kit from the genetic testing company in advance and make a plan ahead of time with the obstetrician so everything is ready and waiting when the baby arrives. Now, what do you do with this information besides freak out? I recommend taking advantage of the chance to be prepared. If you choose to participate in perinatal studies, it's important to be emotionally ready for an unwanted diagnosis and be ready to lean on your support network, however that looks for you. I'm still figuring that part out. The diagnosis can be especially tough because in many cases, it's an inherited problem and can cause feelings of guilt for the parent who carries the gene. Remember that the SADS Foundation has already created a community of people who get it, people who've been in your shoes or at least similar ones and have lived it. The group offers a wealth of information through conferences, online information, and webinars like this one. Use it to your advantage. If you're a medical professional, remember that healing is more than just medicine and make sure your patients and their families have all the tools they need to be successful in taking charge of their own health. 
I think everyone should least learn CPR anyway, but especially if someone you love or take care of has a cardiac problem. It's certainly scary to think you may need to use it, but worse to feel helpless in an emergency. And as far as emergency interventions go, it's a relatively simple one that most people are capable of doing. Known or suspected long QT might call for a different approach to pregnancy. Depending on the severity, it could be more likely to lose the baby late in pregnancy or during infancy or childhood. Considering that possibility is hard to face, but the potential to prevent it, I think, makes finding out early absolutely worth it. Early diagnosis is key for preventing life-threatening events. Pregnancy monitoring was a bit more involved than with a typical pregnancy. My obstetrician counted the fetal heart rate at each visit, both for monitoring purposes and to report the rates for the study. When both studies suggested a likely diagnosis of long QT with our second kid, the OB ordered weekly non-stress tests and biophysical profiles for the remainder of the pregnancy. These can be done together and are kind of like a glorified ultrasound. It sort of felt like overkill and was a bit of a hassle to schedule because by this point we had a rather spirited toddler. However, as toddlers in pregnancy can both be exhausting, I planned the appointments for a time when my husband could be home with our daughter and again took advantage of the chance to take a nap during the monitoring. I quickly learned that eating something delicious like chocolate right before the non-stress test would wake the baby up so they could get the info they needed and send me home sooner. It was a great excuse to eat chocolate and it was also fun to get to, to, get to see the baby's little heart beating and watch what he was doing more often. The information was helpful for looking at the baby's heart rate and variability trends. It helped my doctor know the baby's norm ahead of time so that if anything looked atypical during labor, there was something to compare it to, to avoid unnecessarily needing a C-section. I learned that something that looks like fetal distress in a baby without long QT might not be a reason for concern in my baby. We also did a one-time fetal echocardiogram to look at the heart structure, which was quick and easy. Seems silly. But the biggest problem for us with all the additional monitoring was in trying to keep the baby's gender a surprise. We didn't find out the gender of either of our kids until they were born. There were a lot more chances for other people to peek during all this additional monitoring, and I always had to make sure everyone knew not to spoil the surprise. Knowing that my child likely had long QT was a game changer when it came to making a birth plan. I had learned through my many interactions with medical staff through all of the pregnancy monitoring that long QT is something that is far from common knowledge, especially in babies. We had great support from brilliant cardiologists who collaborated with my OB and hospital staff, yet it was a learning process for many of the people involved, myself included. I felt more comfortable having all relevant long QT information written out and available along with my birth plan so it would be easy to follow for any practitioner or medical staff. During labor is not the time to have to explain yourself. I know people can get frustrated when they receive care from less experienced medical staff, whether it be doctors, nurses, or anyone else. But I also know that given a good learning environment and opportunity, these less experienced people can become phenomenal practitioners. I was happy to spread the word about long QT to residents, students, et cetera, and learn together since they might take care of my grandkids one day. The SADS Foundation offers a list of medications that should be avoided by anyone with long QT, long QT syndrome, which is quite helpful. I printed several copies to keep in my hospital bag and made sure that they were included in my chart and my babies. Even though I don't have the arrhythmia, some medications taken by a pregnant mother can cross the placenta and affect your baby. I continue to print out a re replacement medication list through the SADS website every time it gets updated. Since we had decided beforehand to collect cord blood to send for genetic testing, the cord blood kit was in my hospital bag with paperwork already filled out and ready to go. The OB and delivery nurse had both reviewed the instructions prior to delivery. And collecting cord blood is not hard to do, but you need to be prepared because it has to happen shortly after delivery when everybody's distracted by an adorable little baby. We knew that our baby would have to be in the neonatal intensive care unit for at least 24 hours of monitoring after starting medication to control his heart rate and also have an EKG done. This may have been the toughest part of the whole process. My mama bear instincts did not love the idea of having to recover in a different room than my newborn until I was discharged as a patient. Plus, my son was born during flu season and hospital restrictions prevented my daughter from coming to see him in the NICU. She had to stay with grandparents and didn't meet her little brother until he came home from the hospital. My husband felt torn between rooms also because he wanted to be there for both of us. 
We were allowed to have the first hour after our son's birth together for snuggle time before he was whisked away to his NICU room and hooked up to a cardiorespiratory monitor. Luckily, I recovered well enough to go to his room every couple of hours to feed him, and I asked my husband to stay with him so our little guy wouldn't be alone. I should mention that we had a pre-admission planning meeting in advance, weeks before delivery actually, where my husband and I got to meet the NICU staff and take a tour. We sat down with the fetal cardiologist, obstetrician, and NICU attending physician to be sure that everyone was on the same page with a plan for a baby. This cut down on anxiety quite a bit. Not many people have the opportunity to plan their admission to an intensive care unit, and I'm glad we had the diagnosis ahead of time so we could take care of everything in a controlled setting rather than emergently. Life after going home from the hospital has been pretty typical for a family with a toddler and a newborn, aside from medication and cardiology appointments. My son gets medication every eight hours. It's a tiny volume of an oral solution from a little syringe. He sometimes hates it, and sometimes he sleeps through getting it. Giving medication to a baby can certainly be challenging, but it is doable. We'll see a pediatric cardiologist every two to three months to check in, get an ECG, and adjust medication doses as my son grows. Appointments will become less frequent when he stops growing like a weed. It's important for family, caregivers, teachers, coaches, etc., to know what the risks are and what to do in case of an emergency, and also be CPR certified. Our son goes to daycare a few, a few days a week and has to receive a dose of medication while he's there. I think knowing about his diagnosis makes his teachers nervous that something could happen on their watch, but I needed to be sure that he's in safe hands. The SADS website provides some great resources that can be shared with caregivers so kids are safe. We're learning that there are a lot less restrictions for people with long QT syndrome now than there were when my husband was a kid. I think one of his biggest fears was that our child would be kept from doing a lot of the things that make childhood fun like he was. I know we'll find out in more detail about these restrictions as our son gets older. Since right now he just does the normal baby stuff, eat, sleep, dirty his diaper, and be adorable. But I'm told that as long as he complies with treatment, he could potentially train for the Olympics one day if he wants to. My hopes for my child with long QT. Naturally, I worry about my son's safety. I believe we're doing all the right things to keep him safe and prevent cardiac events, but I know that eventually he's going to grow up and have to make decisions on his own. I hope he makes the right ones for his health. I also know that despite our best efforts, something bad could still happen, and that's terrifying. I'm concerned that he will be treated differently than other kids if people know about his condition, and I hope that people don't single him out or impose restrictions that hurt him emotionally instead of helping him physically. He can choose to keep his diagnosis to himself since it doesn't cause any visible differences, but I hope that he feels comfortable enough to talk about it and accept it. Basically, I want to find a good balance between safety and being able to just be a kid. Like every parent, I want my child to be a good person, be happy, and have a normal life. And I am eternally grateful that so many people are dedicating their lives to making that possible. Thank you so much, Robin. That was... That was wonderful, and thank you to all of our panelists and speakers today for taking the time to really talk through um, this very delicate um, subject of arrhythmias during pregnancy. Um, I know we are very over, so I'm going to go ahead and close this presentation. Um, there will be, um, there should be an email address. Um, I guess we don't have that on there, but feel free to contact the SADS Foundation if you have any questions. And I apologize that we weren't able to get to any Q&A today. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and please look out for further announcements for our next webinars coming up.